Okay, so at this point, I don't know whether some of us are in the building and some not, but uh, we should be perhaps enjoying the same uh, message from, uh, from Romans, whether we're together or online, because I know some are online. And so uh, we're glad that we can be together, whether they're, we're online or not. And uh, Brenda and I may be, if we're all online, we may be in Oregon this weekend uh, trying to spend some time uh, with our son and his fiance since their uh, wedding has been delayed once again and we have not been able to see them since Christmas, which is um, much longer than usual. So hopefully we're enjoying that time with them uh, unless maybe we're all together and, and uh, I'm at the building with some and some of you are watching online. So <laughs> with all of that, uh, Jesus had a reputation <clears throat> for being soft on sin and easy on error. Uh, the religious people around Jesus uh, were the ones who thought this. They didn't think that he should spend time with sinners. Uh, remember Luke 7, he's, where uh, there was this situation when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. He went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Now, the reason she could do that behind him was because he was reclining and his feet were out to the side. So then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of a woman she is, that she is a sinner. Well, they used that sort of thing, which actually happened several times, to accuse Jesus of being soft on sin. But what seemed even more important to them seems to be how he handled religious issues. They thought that Jesus should be more strict where religious rules and practices were involved. Uh, another time, this is in Mark 3, Jesus went into the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees, these are the religious leaders, went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Now this instance shows how far apart Jesus and those religious leaders were. The emotions that Jesus had, anger and deep distress, there aren't any deeper emotions that are described uh, in Jesus, and the reaction that the religious leaders had to actually jump in bed with their most hated enemies, the followers of King Herod, and plot to kill Jesus. But, was the accusation accurate? Was Jesus soft on sin and easy on error? Well, no. Uh, Jesus was disturbed by sin, but what concerned him was what sin did to people. He was distressed by error, but what bothered him was what error did to people. Now, Jesus was dealing here with real undisputed sins and errors. And even then, he showed acceptance of the people who were truly indisputably guilty or wrong about religious issues. Well, what do we do? Have you ever found yourself condemning those who practice religious error? Is that what Jesus did? Do we act as if we are above sinners? Uh, good Christian boys in Arkansas used to say, we don't smoke and we don't chew and we don't go with girls that do. And maybe that mantra only made sense in the South uh, where guys 
smoked and chewed, uh, and maybe even some girls did. But we can apply that spirit to almost every temptation that people fall to. And when we're through, we'll have no way to influence anyone who needs our influence. Paul wrote this letter to all of the Christians in Rome because he knew that many of them did not agree with each other or did not agree with him on a variety of issues. Now, he's been trying to focus on the most central issue of our salvation. Uh, is it through faith or was it through fulfilling religious and moral laws? Uh, now, as he is drawing things to a close after spending a lot of time on how we are transformed into a better way of thinking, we spent three lessons from three chapters on what to do. He turns to a major what not to do which then leads to another better way of thinking and acting. He knows that there are lots of arguments among the Christians in Rome. He even implies that there's some quarreling. Well, much of it has something to do with Jewish laws because there were actually a lot of Pharisees who were now Christians. Look at Acts 15 if you weren't aware of that. And their thinking has not been fully transformed. Remember that Paul himself was also a Pharisee, but his thinking has been transformed. But the basic teaching applies to all disputes among Christians. So it applies to us, even though we're not Pharisees. Well, Paul says that we must be careful to show acceptance to those with whom we simply disagree. Turn with me to Romans 14, 1. Uh, Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. So, we must show acceptance to those with whom we disagree. Acceptance. But how can we do that? If we will accept two realities, we will be able to become more like Jesus in our treatment of people. First of all, never lose sight of these two realities. First of all, God is the judge. Uh, now, this is not an option. He's not a candidate for the position. This is a reality. Now, how does this reality affect our relationships with others? Let's read on. Except the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters, one person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, Servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Uh, have you ever been put into a position of authority over people who were your friends? You know, uh, it sometimes doesn't work out too well, you know, because then if you have to warn someone who's been taking life easy on the job, what happens? Sometimes just the fact that you are in authority, no matter how positive everything is, sometimes that alone is enough to create a barrier where one did not exist before. If God is the judge, we don't have to worry about every move that our fellow worker makes. God will take care of me and he will take care of you. We are equals and no barriers need exist. But there are no limits, uh, or, or <laughs> the question is, are there no limits uh, to how far we carry this principle? Uh, well, no, there aren't, uh, not to the principle. The fact that God is the judge should affect our attitudes toward any and every person. And this will help us to accept all sorts of things that we may not, that we may not like or that we may find offensive. But as Paul is drawing this letter to the Romans to a close, he applies this principle to teachings and practices regarding what he calls disputable matters. Or many English translations just call them opinions. What kinds of things is he talking about? Well, Paul gives us three examples. Uh, one is whether or not Christians should eat meat. Uh, he says, one person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. Now, this is probably uh, brought up because most of the meat that was sold in Rome was meat offered to idols or that was, was unclean uh, by Jewish standards. Uh, so it's not exactly the same issue as, as we face today regarding uh, eating meat and vegetarians. But whether or not certain days, such as the Sabbath and the Jewish feast days, were holy uh, was another issue. Uh, one person 
considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Uh, the third example that Paul gives is just implied, but and it's on down in verse 21 where he says, it is better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. So that implies that drinking wine was a disputable matter. Well, what made these things disputable? Uh, what things can be left unsettled? What things uh, can be left unsettled are, first of all, things that are not clearly laid out. Uh, relative silence. The word relative is important. There was relatively little teaching from the Old Testament scriptures or the apostles teaching or Jesus teaching, uh, but we couldn't say that there was no teaching. The apostles told, for instance, what Jesus had said about clean and unclean foods. It's not what goes into a man that makes him unclean, but what comes out of him. Uh, they also told how he said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Uh, he also turned water into wine at a wedding feast. And yet Paul gave these as examples of disputable matters. Well, maybe Paul just wasn't sure about these things himself, and that's why he called them disputable. Maybe there were things that really were neutral, and there was no right or wrong. Well, if you look at verse 14, that doesn't quite hold up. He says, I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person, it is unclean. So do you think Paul was wrong? Uh, I don't. I think he was right. Uh, so doesn't the truth matter? Well, everything matters at a certain level. But the most important things will be spelled out by God through Jesus, through his apostles, through other scriptures. And that leads to the second thing that makes something a disputable matter uh, that doesn't have to be settled in order to accept other Christians. And that is things that are not central issues. The fact that Jesus is Lord is a central issue. The fact that God gave him to die for us is a central issue. The fact that he rose from the dead is a central issue. The fact that we are saved by grace through faith in those facts is a central issue. But if you look at statements of beliefs on websites or other places these days, you'll see those statements plus a lot of others that are not so clearly laid out in Scripture. And those others lead some Christians to reject each other. And think about this. What was Jesus' answer when he was asked what was the greatest commandment? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So this is the most central of all teachings. And if you look at even uh, standing creeds that go way back uh, and statements of beliefs of churches on websites and other places, it's extremely rare to find any reference to that in their lists of central beliefs. Well, if that is not our first thought, when people ask us what we believe, we need to rethink our priorities. Uh, this is what Paul's teaching here is all about. Well, the third reason those issues could be left unsettled was because they pertain to personal behavior. One person could be a vegetarian, even if no one else was. One person could keep the Sabbath, even if no one else did. One person com could completely abstain from alcohol, even if no one else did. Now, what else could be added to the list? You know, what else fits with those three uh, things that, that make something, uh, something that we should be able to live with uh, without settling? Well, let me just list some other possibilities, and I want you to work out whether or not they are disputable yourself. These are all issues that have been made matters that determined whether a person was to be accepted by other Christians. Now, some of them seem kind of funny. But uh, one is head coverings, not face coverings, <laughs> but head coverings, uh, dancing, braiding hair, wearing makeup, wearing jewelry, going to movies, wearing colorful clothing, exposing any skin except for hands and face, clothes with buttons, uh, using electric lights or motorized machinery, uh, giving to orphans homes from the church, 
giving to missionary societies from the church, giving to Christian colleges by churches, eating in the church building, having classes in addition to the assembly, having group Bible studies in homes, having prayer partners was a disputed matter in response to some campus ministry practices when I was in campus ministry. Adding instrumental music to singing, you know, is one that has been one of those things among us. So none of these are actually clearly decided by specific scriptures, but some can be kept between yourself and God, and maybe others can't. So what do we do when they can't be kept between ourselves and God? Well, that's determined by the other reality. Reality number one is that God is the judge. Reality number two is that we are servants. Paul asked the question in verse four, who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Well, this is a central issue. Uh, whether we are right or wrong about something, we'd better be doing it because we want to be good servants. If it's a disputable matter and we are wrong, but we're acting because of our faith and trust in God, he will accept even our wrong actions. Look at verse 6. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God, and whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. So remember, verse 4 said, He will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. We are not to judge others because they are God's servants. And since we too are God's servants and they shouldn't judge us, can we then ignore their opinions and feelings? Well, no. So then, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I'm convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself, but if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what you know is good to be spoken of as evil, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Therefore, let us make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. And it is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. He says, do not destroy the work of God for food. Well, what is the work of God? In this context, it is your brother or sister in Christ. As servants of God, we have a responsibility to our fellow servants. It is to make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Well, let's go back to the issue of uh, the entertainment media that was in that list. I'm fully convinced to use Paul's words that watching television is not wrong in itself, but watching some things is wrong. Uh, doing nothing but watching TV is wrong. Uh, and just accepting every idea that a show or a commercial might promote is wrong. So let's just say that because of all of these pitfalls, you actually believe that watching TV was just purely of the devil. Well, then you should not watch television until your thinking has changed. Paul explains why. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves, but... Whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat because their eating is not from faith. And everything that does not come from faith is sin. We just need to remember that we are children and God accepts us as children. And thank goodness that he doesn't look upon us as adults. If he did, we'd have to be perfect. We would be accountable for everything that we do. Well, when our children or grandchildren say, can I help? 
you know, we should try to say, why, thank you for asking. And then when their help causes you more work or when they do something that seems to them to be outstanding and it really isn't, what do we do then? Well, if we love them, we thank them and we praise them and we'll teach them better methods when we can. But for now, we'll accept their good intentions, right? That's how God treated those who thought that they were doing good when they treated one day as special or when they refused to eat meat. They intended it as praise to God. So that's how he accepted it. Now, he will accept our sincere efforts to praise him in the same way, even when we are completely wrong about what he wants. That doesn't mean that it doesn't matter at all whether we learn more and become more effective in our service to him. Of course, our misunderstandings can cause some difficulty for others or mislead others even as to the nature of God. But God's mercy still translates our efforts into acceptable praise. In the meantime, quarreling does more harm than the misunderstandings. Now, on the other hand, uh, have you ever come home to find your children acting guilty? And you couldn't tell why. I had a five-gallon bucket of old tennis balls when Jeremy was little, and I, I, I had coached the junior high tennis team when I was teaching. Well, tennis balls just go flat from exposure to air, and so they weren't worth much. But I couldn't just throw them away. You know, it's against my nature. Well, there's something about balls that puppies and boys seem to find very special. Uh, so let's say that Jeremy had come up with some really fun game that resulted in all of those balls landing in a mud puddle. And then he started feeling guilty because he thought those balls meant a lot to me. And so I might say, why do you look so guilty? And he might fess up and wait for me to explode. Well, what should I have done if that had happened? I should have explained that the tennis balls weren't really important after all. And then his pulse rate would have gone down a couple of notches. And then I should have raised that pulse rate back up by saying, but since you thought that you were doing something that you shouldn't do, I've got to punish you just like I would have if you had taken my good tennis balls. That's how God must treat us when we do things that we believe are wrong, not things that we just feel funny about. You know, there are some things that we don't really have any reason for feeling funny about them, except that we just do, but things that we are really not sure about and we really feel that might really be wrong, or we've even been taught that they were wrong, but we just don't quite uh, get that. And that is why we must never influence someone to do something that they believe is wrong. We can and we should teach the truth, uh, and then they can do those things with us, but not until then. Uh, for example, even if all dancing is not wrong, as some have taught, it would be wrong for you to ask someone who believed it is wrong to go with you or if your brothers are, uh, and sisters are distressed when you go without asking them to participate. Look at verse 15. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. So even if drinking wine or beer in small amounts is not wrong, it would be wrong for you to not care what your brothers and sisters in Christ believe. Even if gambling, a small amount of money, is not wrong, it would be wrong for you to persuade someone to come along and hit the tables if they believe it is wrong. So, Paul says, whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat because their eating is not from faith and everything that does not come from faith is sin. As Paul wrote the letter to the Romans, he knew he was right about being saved by grace and not by works of merit. He knew he was right about the Gentiles being loved by God. He knew that the law was perfect for what it was, but that it was not going to save anyone. But all through his letter, while Paul tried to explain these concepts clearly, he never forgot that some wouldn't quite get it. Some didn't want to get it. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about those who wanted to understand and they wanted to do what was right, but they just couldn't grasp it. They, wouldn't, they would grasp at it, but they were too weak to hold on. And so he gave them a way to get along with each other 
as they were. And he closes this line of instruction with this in chapter 15. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not just please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good, to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. And skip on to verse five. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. And finally on down in verse 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in him so that we may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray together as we remember Jesus' sacrifice once again. Our Father, as we take this bread that represents Jesus' body, uh, let's help us to remember Jesus' sacrifice and his attitude and to have that same attitude and to be willing to give up our uh, desires and even our rights for the sake of others. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. And as we take the, the cup, <clears throat> let's pray again. Our Father, we uh, know that Jesus lived a life, a long life, before he even entered into his ministry. Uh, and to some extent, if not always, that spirit that he had was, was in him. But we know that that when he died, he said that he was going to, before he died, he said that he was going to give that spirit to his followers and to us, and that that became necessary uh, in order for us, his death became necessary in order for us to receive uh, that gift. Uh, and Father, we pray that as we think about the blood that he shed uh, and the life that was in that blood, that we will uh, be willing to shed our blood to give our lives in the same way, uh, even when we think we're right, even when we think we're uh, being uh, mistreated uh, for others. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. So I'm not sure whether we're gonna continue any more lessons in Romans. There, there are some other things that we could cover, but that's the content of Romans at this time. And uh, I hope that you will read back through the entire book and uh, try to remember those central issues that, uh, that Paul raises and also to set aside those issues that might cause you to feel that we should divide from each other or from others uh, because that's not God's will. Have a great week. <clears throat>